This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Welcome back to this afternoon. I'll do an introduction which is probably uh, brief to the point of being abrupt, but we obviously want to hear what, what Moen's going to say. He did his doctorate at Stanford, worked in uh, a number of Canadian universities, and, and is now at uh, Professor of Philosophy at Toronto. He has a senses project about which we may be learning more, uh, funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council in Canada. So, uh, Moen, welcome, and we look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Thank you, Martin. Uh, this morning's speakers didn't get applause beforehand, did they? So there's, it's obviously uh, the talk's not over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, yeah, right. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so, um, so philosophers have recently been talking quite a lot about the fact that others have talked about for a long time, namely that. Art is universal among humans, but doesn't exist among animals. Maybe Greg will say something different later on about bowerbirds. I don't know. But the um, question is, what distinctively human or possibly hominid ca characteristics account for that? I mean, what, what, what is it exactly that we have that uh, animals don't? So that's, that's, the, that's the problem to deal with. So to start, I'm going to talk about what that there are certain problems in the explanation of art which I think are not widely recognized. And this is what I want to spend about a third of, a little bit more than a third of my talk um, explaining. So here's one thing. What is it that attracts us about art? What, what is it about art that is good for us and for our pleasure? Um, so. Uh, a small caveat, I'm going to stay with sensory as opposed to conceptual art, so I'm not going to talk about literature, for instance, and I'm not going to talk about conceptual art either. Um, and also, I'm going to stick to traditional art, because we want to know what it is that uh, distinguishes us from the animals. There's no point fast-forwarding to the 21st century. I think we have to go back uh, a good ways and deal with traditional forms of art. So. Sticking to those things, art is marked by certain what I call primary attractors. And the primary attractors are things like beat, meter, melody, harmony in music, uh, pattern, uh, and there are various aspects of pattern, including occlusion and enclosure and the line of beauty and so on and so forth. So pattern, color, and pictorial representation in uh, <coughs> visual art, uh, and rhythm and graceful movement in uh, dance. It's um, very notable that much of what primarily attracts us in art is uh, something that only uh, humans and our recent ancestors have the capacity to actually produce. So just to take visual art as an example, um, it's, um, it's um, uh, mainly, you know, our recent ancestors, perhaps apes, that have a very well-developed feature processing system in the visual, uh, uh, as Margaret was talking about this morning. Uh, we have a watt system and a very well-developed watt system, whereas animals have a less well, uh, lower animals, aside from primates, have a lower, less of a uh, watt system. They have more of a wear system. So, and, um, so these capacities are all having to do with, uh, with recently acquired capacities. OK, so the primary attractors, those things that I just mentioned, are what get us interested in art. Um, and they're what make it pleasurable to contemplate in the first instance. And a lot of energy has gone into explaining why the primary attractors are attractive. But um, primary attractors are simply not enough. Um, so here's a picture of a beautiful scene. Um, it's a, a keynote standard. It's the thing that you replace with a photograph of your own choosing. But there, there it is. Um, the, 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 pho the photograph is pleasurable to look at, to be sure. 
But it's mainly pleasurable to, be, to look at because you're looking at the scene, and the scene is pleasurable to look at. Um, it's uh, certainly not enough that for some picture to be beautiful as a picture for it to be depictive of a beautiful scene. Um, artistic merit is independent of the beauty of the scene which is portrayed. That is to say, the scene could be absolutely fabulous and the picture could be accurate, but a lousy work of art. And conversely, the scene could be very ugly and accurately portrayed, and it'd be a fabulous piece of art. OK, so, um, so one thing to notice right away is that if you're talking about art, that there are two sets of attractors. And one, uh, as I'll keep um, emphasizing throughout, want to explain why it is that there are two sets of attractors. Why aren't primary attractors um, enough? Or what's the function of the secondary attractors? Why do the secondary attractors attract us? So all right, with that in mind, let's go to something like art and pleasure. What, what is the um, um, pleasure that are given us by art? Here's a story that, uh, that was told in the New York Times about six weeks ago. Um, in 1963, a very young Jamie Wyeth, I think he was 17 years old, uh, uh, painted a portrait of Helen Tausig, who was a very prominent uh, pediatric cardios, cardiologist or possibly um, surgeon, cardiological surgeon. Um, and um, there it is. He, it's, a, it's a very dramatic uh, picture of uh, this uh, woman, a 65-year-old woman. Um, she hated it. Her friends hated it. Johns Hopkins University Hospital hated it, and it was put into storage and wasn't seen again for about 50 years when it was discovered, rediscovered last year. Uh, so her friends said it made her look witchy, whatever that means. Um, OK. So they said they should get, an, they should get a, a substitute for this picture, something that could be hung for this very distinguished surgeon. right? And so they got a substitute. And there it is. <laughs> it's obviously you know, reasonably skilled. It, uh, nice pastels. Look at those. You know, it's, it's, it's a very, in many ways, a very pleasing picture. The question is, why is that? Uh, well, I shouldn't uh, prejudge, but I, I would ask you to judge which one is closer to art. I mean, I, 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 I wager you've heard of Jamie Wyeth, but not Brown Schmidt. Uh, who actually painted that picture. Um, and um, so, but Tausig and her pals uh, and the Johns Hopkins University Hospital found that picture to be much more pleasing than Jamie Wyatt's. Why? Another uh, sort of uh, indication of the same sort of thing is uh, the, the strange relationship between classicism and simplicity. So here's E.H. Gombrich writing in his book on, um, I think it's called The Sense of Order, about decorative art. Uh, it says, in the history of Western art, the aesthetic ideal of restraint is inextricably wove, interwoven with the classical tradition. The confidence with which we speak of barbaric splendor, the confidence meaning you're dissing barbaric splendor, right? I mean, um, betrays our deep-seated conviction that non-barbarians have other standards of excellence. Uh, a deliberate rejection of ornamental profusion has always been a sign of classical influence. And he mentions in this context the chapel of the Badia Fiesolana, um, which, um, as he says, Alberti's desire to see the interior of churches white is reflected in the uh, interior of the Badia and Fiesole, which relies for its effect entirely on proportion. So you're actually eschewing um, uh, the, uh, everything else aside from proportion. Well, there must be something else. but. Um, so why would it be a, a virtue to have fewer primary attractors? Right? Um, uh, and Gombrich um, talks uh, says very sardonically that, to my knowledge, no contemporary member of the culture criticized an Indian temple, a Moorish palace, a Gothic cathedral, or a Spanish Baroque church as over ornate, meaning that this, I this idea of simplicity is very culture bound. OK. So secondary attractors, art is always constrained by 
uh, by fine execution and by form. Um, these are required even where supererogatory for pleasure in contemplation, right? So the boy next door learning how to play the drums produces a good rhythm, but you don't want to uh, listen to him necessarily. Uh, and Bauernschmidt's uh, portrait of Tausig, they have many visual primary attractors, uh, and, and of course the boy has auditory or musical primary attractors. Uh, so why are they not art? And what's, what's, what's good about having these secondary attractors? What's the, what's the advantage? So there's been a lot of, uh, um, so there are two things to explain about why humans have art. Uh, first is, why are the primary attractors attractive? And the second is, why does art constrain the primary attractors by form and execution? Sorry, I did these slides very early in this morning, so there's some mistakes. OK, so um, most accounts are fractured. So Pinker, for instance, concentrates on the primary attractors. Um, he says um, he's, he has a very violent and invasive notion of art. Uh, Art is a pleasure technology that gives the brain mega doses of agreeable stimuli without the messiness of electrodes and drugs. Right? Uh, so <laughs> that's, that's, that's Pinker. Uh, but the sexual selection thesis, recently made popular by Jeffrey Miller and Dennis Dutton, um, focuses on the secondary attractors. Uh, because what they're talking, so Dutton's theory of art is that art is a form of sexual showing off that the artist, uh, who is almost always male, gets the mate, who is almost always female, um, and does so by showing uh, his genetic prowess in that he can waste all this time on perfecting art. Right? So high standards of execution means more time wasted um, and therefore um, more um, genetic um, excellence, right? So anyway, these are two very different uh, kinds of explanations, and the two different, very different kinds of explanations uh, are, are, address very different aspects of art. One, the primary, and the other, the secondary <coughs> attractors. So, okay, that's an observation. So, new point. So let's think about aesthetic pleasure. And we have to get it straight about what sort of thing aesthetic pleasure is. There are two kinds of evaluation. Here are two kinds of evaluation. The first kind of evaluation is prospective evaluation. So this happens before you've done something. And what it does is to get you to do that thing. <coughs> All right. So um, it tells you to do something. Hunger is like this. It tells you to eat. Thirst is like this. It tells you to drink and sexual arousal similarly. So that's prospective. It's a reason for acting. It's a cause of action. There's also reactive evaluation. And reactive evaluation isn't before the fact. It isn't a cause. It isn't a motive. But it is a motive. Uh, but it's, but it's, um, it tells you that something that you're doing is good, or something that you're doing it to. So in the case of eating, it's something that you're doing it to. Uh, so um, enjoyment of physical exercise or of specific foods and drinks. So you, you put some delicious piece of some cheese in your mouth, and you enjoy it. So that tells you, keep, keep eating me. Right? So, uh, but it's not initially a motivation for eating. Eating is sort of object nonspecific, and you have to learn through experience what things you like to eat. So um, reactive evaluation is not a cause of action. It's a reaction to the action. So that is one distinction between, pros I'm sorry, between what was, what was it? prospective and reactive evaluation. And now two more kinds. Okay, So here's another distinction. Sorry to be such a philosopher. So here's uh, first is an object forward kind of evaluation. It tells you that a particular object 
is good for some purpose and that you should do something to get it so that it can fulfill that purpose. Um, when you're thirsty, you want to drink something. Uh, yeah, but thirst is not informative about what you should drink. Uh, thirst just gets you to consume a liquid because the liquid serves a bodily need. So, um, I'm sorry, this example seems to be an example of something other than object forward evaluation. But anyway, the point is that uh, thirst gets you to drink something, but it doesn't tell you uh, what to drink, right? So it's not object forward, sorry. Um, what's an object, well, I'll come back to an object forward form of evaluation. Um, but an activity forward uh, evaluation tells you that some activity that you're performing is, I'm sorry, I, I got confused. Let's, let me go back to this. Um, the, it's, thirst is object forward because it leads you to get some liquid which um, satisfies your thirst. So it's object forward in that it's, it's directed towards the thing that will do something for you. Okay, sorry to bungle that. Whereas an evaluation, I'm sorry, an active for activity forward evaluation, uh, when you relax outside on a nice day, pleasure tells you to keep going, but it doesn't tell you something about a bodily need. It doesn't tell you anything particular about the surroundings in which you are relaxing. Your surroundings give you pleasure, but not with respect to, um, and only with respect to that activity. And the pleasure has no natural cessation point. So thirst is ceases when you've drunk, but um, relaxing outside, there's no particular reason to stop. It doesn't, there's no such thing as having enough relaxation, so the, the, the desire is stopping. You might get tired, but that's a separate, um, a separate thing. Okay, so just to get those two clear, which I have been notably failing to do, uh, here are some examples. So um, first, here's prospective object forward um, motivation or evaluation, sexual desire. It's prospective because it gets you to do something. It's object forward because it's directed towards a particular object uh, who is the object of your desires. An activity forward um, prospective um, evaluation is hunger, tells you to eat. A reactive objective object forward uh, evaluation is gustatory pleasure. It says that this particular thing is good to eat. And finally, there's aesthetic pleasure. It says that this is good to contemplate, or this is good to look at, or this is good to listen to, uh, but it doesn't particularly tell you that you want to get the object for some bodily need. So aesthetic pleasure is about contemplating something. Uh, for example, looking to it, or looking at it, or listening to it. Uh, it tells you that what you're doing is good, tells you keep going. It's object directed only self-referentially. It tells you that a particular object is good for what you are doing. Okay, so uh, no satiation point, except um, because you can't keep going. So if you're looking at a painting, you might get tired, and then you don't enjoy comp contemplating it anymore. But um, that's basically it. There's no, it, the, the, the pleasure doesn't stop except because the activity itself stops. Okay, so here's a wrong turn in explaining aesthetic pleasure. It's very um, fashionable, been a, very fashionable in the last 20 or 30 years to explain our aesthetic pleasure in contemplating something by reference to the value of that something. So here's Stephen Davies in his recent book. The fact that we need food, water, and shelter wherever we find ourselves and whatever form our social life takes. This alone may establish a baseline landscape aesthetic that is applied to varying local conditions. People who are naturally drawn to congenial habitats who found them appealing and pleasing would have had an edge in reproductive success over those who are not. So what Stephen Davies is saying is that uh, landscapes of a certain sort are valuable. 
They're valuable because they provide shelter, safety, food, etc. For that reason, we find them aesthetically valuable. Um, but that seems to be a non sequitur because finding them aesthetically valuable is finding it pleasant to look at them. And finding it pleasant to look at them does not follow from finding it, you know, wanting to live in them. So essentially, he uses a prospective object forward evaluation to explain aesthetic pleasure, but aesthetic pleasure is activity forward and reactive, and so it's just wrong on both counts. Here, on, by contrast, is a correct explanatory structure, and this is from an article by Tubi and Cosmides. Um, a human being should find something beautiful because it exhibits cues which, in the environment in which humans evolved, signaled that it would have been advantageous to pay sustained sensory attention to it. So Tubi and Cosmides are squarely locate the advantage of aesthetic contemplation in contemplation, not in some other advantage that the object gives us. So um, this is the, um, that it would have been advantageous to pay sustained attention to it. Uh, whereas Davies said it would have been advantageous to choose it as a habitat, which is quite different. So uh, they've got, they've got um, in the absence of instrumental reasons for doing so. Um, so they've got um, something which has roughly the right things. It's the activity that is foregrounded, the activity of contemplating something that is foregrounded um, not, um, um, and not some other value that could be got out of consuming that thing. Another structurally correct account comes from um, a somewhat well-known philosopher, Kant, uh, on disinterested pleasure. Kant, uh, it's the essence of Kant's theory that aesthetic appreciation consuming or possessing the, the object is irrelevant. What's relevant is the perceptual representation of that object, and you should be able to appreciate the perceptual representation of that object independently of any value that the object has uh, inst uh, you know, um, instrumentally. All right, so um, very briefly, the things that have to be explained are first, the existence of primary and secondary attractors, and second, the value in contemplating, some, contemplating something perceptually as opposed to consuming it in some other way. Those are the things that need to be explained. So here's the um, explanatory framework. We haven't got to the explanation yet, but here's the, the framework that I want to use. Um, so it involves play, practice, and pleasure. So um, a skill is an ability that's developed by repeated trying. Very Aristotelian kind of definition of skill. Um, human skill comes in two varieties, two kinds of trying. And uh, so some skills are spontaneously developed. I call them SD skills. The spontaneously developed skills, um, first of all, develop in response to um, Tryings which are spontaneous, right? You just you don't have to put in any great effort in order to engage in these tryings. Uh, you, they just come spontaneously, and it so happens that the skills develop at a predictable rate to predictable baseline levels. Then there's effortfully acquired skills, and the effortfully sk acquired skills, the trying is painful and unpleasant. It's sustained. It's uh, something that you have to force yourself to do. It's motivated. It isn't spontaneous. It's motivated externally. It's motivated by precisely the goal of achieving a high level of skill. right? But that high level of skill is individually set. So you might practice the piano until you arrive at a certain amateur good amateur level of playing. Or you might practice the piano until you arrive at a much more expert uh, or even virtuoso level of playing. And um, 
the goal is self-set, um, but the practice to get to that goal is painful and unpleasant. So usually, um, um, EA skills develop SD skills to above baseline levels. So if you take examples like language and singing and manual dexterity, um, every child learns language without any uh, effort or instruction. Um, similarly, singing, similarly, a certain amount of manual dexterity. It's all done by trying, by, you know, by repeatedly practicing something. Um, but in the case of getting just to the baseline level of speaking language or being able to screw in a light bulb, um, you do, just do it, you know, you just get to that level at a certain age, a predictable, um, you know, at a predictable rate um, and with spontaneous activity. But each of these can be developed far beyond the baseline. People can learn how to articulate very clearly. They can acquire huge vocabularies. They can learn uh, to speak very fast or rhythmically. Um, similarly with singing, similarly with manual dexterity. And this is done with practice. So somebody who has the manual dexterity to be um, an artist, say, um, has to work very hard to get up to that level, um, up beyond the baseline to the level of expertise. So two, two kinds of skills. And they'll be important in explaining the two kinds of attraction. So um, spontaneously developed skill and pleasure, evolution gives humans a sort of spontaneous urge to or infants, I should say, a spontaneous urge to uh, exercise these activities. Um, there's language, there's spontaneous mu music making, there's bipedality and fe feature-centered vision. All of these things um, develop by doing it again and again. Um, and um, um, it's just done spontaneously. The, the, the um, idea is that. Um, it's done spontaneously because when you're developing these skills, when infants who are developing these skills enjoy doing it. They take delight in looking at faces or trying to walk or babbling or any of these other skills, or any of these other activities which develop the skills. So it's characteristic of humans that they realize that their faculties can be raised above baseline levels. And it requires effortful practice, usually with coaching. Um, humans are self-motivated to ha achieve high EA skill levels, but they set their own level that they can achieve. Right? Um, animals, of course, can also get uh, above baseline levels, but they have to be trained. They're not self-motivated to improve their baseline level skills. So Livazano horses, I imagine, would not do dressage without some training. Um, so what happens when people are practicing is that if they haven't achieved the level that they want to achieve, um, then they try to do it at a higher level than they're strictly speak speaking capable of. This gives them displeasure because they have to think through it through different steps. And it's a difficult process where they have to teach themselves how to do it. When they get to the level that they want to get to, they can perform the action with a certain degree of fluency. And the fluency um, gives them um, pleasure at that aspirational level. They're not trying to get any better, so they're performing fluently. So there's a different kind of pleasure that's <coughs> attached to the attainment of a certain skill level with EA skills, and that is the pleasure of fluency of performing at a level that you've already um, learned and have aspired to. OK, so that's, that's the explanatory framework. What I want, I want to explain um, uh, art in terms of these two uh, types of skill, uh, the first being spontaneously development, developed skills, and the other being effortfully acquired skills. So here's the actual theory. So first, a notion of perceptual play um, or perceptual skill. So infants, of course, famously, 
um, are subject to a booming, buzzing confusion. Um, and there's something, there's a series of activities by which they spontaneously learn to perceive. Number of studies, there are uh, the famous studies in the 1960s of, first of all, kittens that were deprived of sensory motor feedback, and then kittens that were uh, deprived of lines of a certain orientation. So Colin Blakemore did some of this work uh, where kittens were, were placed in an environment where they only had horizontal lines or only had vertical lines, and their visual diet, as Colin put, put it to me, uh, excluded the other kind. And then they were not able, uh, beyond the development later on, to discriminate or respond to the absent um, kind of stimulus. So answer, what the uh, moral to be taken from that, that in order to learn to perceive, this is called perceptual learning, um, you need to practice perception. Um, an another uh, example is that of uh, phonetic perception. Um, so Janet Worker and Richard Tease in the 1980s did this work where they showed how children lose the ability to respond to phonemes in languages that they're not exposed to, right? So they can, all children start out with equal ability to hear Japanese phonemes and English phonemes, but then it just comes down and comes down by listening, right? Uh, an exactly uh, analogous experiment on face perception was done by these people, um, and they uh, showed that just as your ability to pick up phonemes rises in accuracy and speed for your native language and falls for your languages that you're not exposed to, so also your ability to discriminate faces rises for your native ethnicity and falls for other ethnicities, unless you're exposed to those ethnicities. Um, so um, that's, that's that literature. So this is all literature on perceptual learning. And what it shows is that there are skills which develop through exposure and repeated activity of a certain sort. So, so play, in general, a notion of play is, um, and, and, and maybe this is not a very general notion of play, but uh, a certain notion of play. Play is spontaneously undertaken activity, undertaken because, evolutionarily because, not, not consciously because, evolutionarily because, it develops skills. So um, infants attend spontaneously to certain significant patterns in the world. Um, and this develops baseline perceptual skills. So they enjoy this. Spontaneous activity is encouraged by enjoyment. So here's the basic idea that I want to put forward, that the patterns, this is actually very congruent with some of the psychological and neurological theories that have been put forward and which you heard uh, some of this morning, um, that these patterns are at least some of the primary attractors of art. I don't want to say they're all of the primary attractors of art because, for instance, musical harmony has something to do with the way the Basilar membrane is constructed and doesn't have anything to do with uh, particular ecological skill. But what I want to say is that people enjoy cert doing certain things again and again. Uh, many of them are for the purposes of developing baseline perceptual skills. So as I say, there's a congruent with the work of uh, v. S. Ramachandran and Hurstein, Samir Zeki, Margaret Livingston. Um, and what's added to their work is a certain thesis about pleasure. That is to say, it's not just that these are features of art but the, the, or of, of beautiful things, but that these are, um, these give you pleasure. Okay, so um, um, the primary attractors are based on features that engage perceptual play. There are others as well, and, uh, but this is what I want to emphasize. But as I've been emphasizing, those primary attractors are not sufficient for uh, the development of art, and they're not sufficient for artistic merit. So 
Um, so I want to make a connection between effortfully acquired perceptual skill and deliberate perceptual learning. So we, we talked about spontaneous perceptual learning. Now I want to talk about deliberate perceptual learning. So perceptual skills can be developed beyond SD or basic baseline levels. So there's a skill of picking out relevant information. So lots of work has been done on, on certain aspects of this. So um, visual pattern and fingerprint experts, it turns out that fingerprints experts are able to attentively, sorry, selectively attend to certain spatial frequencies. So when you're looking at a fingerprint, there's a lot of dirt, so on and so forth, but there are also these walls, and they're able to attend to the walls at the expense of the dust modes and, and whatnot. It takes about two years. Um, the species identification among ichthyologists, I, I'm, I'm referring to these because there are studies that deal with precisely these uh, patterns of learning. Um, and there's also uh, the actual coaching of amblyotic patients. I don't know how much um, credence this particular set of studies has, but it turns out that perceptual learning in amblyotic patients, that is to say those who have lazy eye and so um, they have a brain, they, the, the information from the lazy eye doesn't go to the brain, um, but it turns out that at least these people claim that by teaching them to attend to certain spatial frequencies and so on and so forth, they can actually reverse the amblyopia and there are some brain changes as a consequence of that. So um, here's an assertion which I don't think is very uh, controversial. That art appreciation, and when I say art appreciation, I don't mean just visual appreciation, um, involves effortfully acquired perceptual skill. Right, so you cannot simply uh, walk into it blind. It's not a primary attractor kind of thing. Um, so all appreciation of art, including so-called low art, uh, involves effortfully acquired perceptual skill. So final um, observation here that um, any artifact, here's a claim, that any artifact is enhanced by the incorporation of primary attractors. So you have a screwdriver, it's enhanced by building some sort of pattern into its um, handle. So any artifact at all, any, a house, uh, anything. Um, so there's a spontaneous emergence of decorated artifacts uh, throughout history. But the making of decorated artifacts requires motor skills. And I haven't talked much about motor skills here because motor skills are pretty well known and motor play and motor learning. But just as there's all of those things on the perceptual side, there is much more well known the same sorts of things on the motor side. So these decorated artifacts uh, come about through motor play. So somebody is doodling, say, and doodles on an artifact that they make, thereby giving it uh, enhanced value. So motor play is activity which is enjoyed and spontaneously undertaken, just as um, perceptual activity is. So the thesis is that it's natural for human, it's a natural human characteristic to try and develop at least some skills beyond spontaneously developed levels. Uh, and given this, um, I envisage a kind of virtuous spiral. Artifacts are made through spontaneous motor play to engage perceptual play. Perceptual skill develops by looking and, and enjoying these artifacts but perceptual skill develops and there's a greater level of discrimination as a result of perceptual learning. Um, and then motor play develops to satisfy greater perceptual skill and so on and so forth. And so there's a sort of development, uh, a, a, a cyclical development of uh, perceptual play and motor play. So the secondary attractors, um, Art is the product of a virtuous cycle in which value is added to ordinary artifacts. Uh, this is just decorative art, of course. Um, uh, but by increasingly skilled production and increasingly skilled perceptual discrimination. 
Um, and the secondary attractors are features that are discerned by effortfully acquired perceptual skills. That's the thesis. So the secondary attractors are produced and in turn produced by effortfully acquired motor skills. So um, the thesis distinguishes the appeal of the primary and secondary attractors, but makes them both byproducts of skill development, though albeit different types of skill development, and different foci of pleasure. Uh, SD pleasure is just spontaneous pleasure in a spontaneously undertaken activity. EA pleasure is pleasure which is uh, that of executing something fluently by a having arrived at that level of fluency by a hard and painful process of deliberate practice. So um, that, that was the thesis. I'll just make two concluding remarks. Uh, one is about the role of form. Um, I don't have really have very much to say about this, at least not here. Um, that effortfully acquired skills are sp extremely specialized. They, they don't go right across the whole domain of uh, human activity. Um, art appreciation demands specialized perceptual skills and form codifies special specialized perceptual skill. So the reason according to this I, way of looking at it why it's not easy to for a foreigner to appreciate uh, Chinese opera or uh, Kathakali uh, is that they just haven't acquired the perceptual skills needed to take pleasure in that. And my last remark, uh, what's the difference between humans and other animals? Um, uh, so uh, animals engage in play and skill development. Uh, but they, but, and so maybe for all you know, they might have um, so sort of pleasure of primary attractors. They certainly play with each other, but they take pleasure or not is, is, um, is up for grabs. But uh, I'm quite happy to allow that they do. But they have no natural urge to develop their skills beyond spontaneously developed levels. Um, so um, possibly, um, so there's no virtuous spiral, and hence no development of art. Thank you. Give me no, sh no shortage, shortage of questions, questions. so I'll, I'll take them geographically. One, two, three, four, five, six. six. Right, right, one. Come on, I, I like the thesis, and it reminds me of uh, something that Baxendahl says, uh, Michael Baxendahl said about the degree of um, skill that was required to produce an object may mean that when we're looking at it, that there's a degree of skill required to discriminate and notice to extract the information that we enjoy the exercise of, of that uh, skillful perceptual discrimination and that is and that makes something to our taste. But um, I'm wondering how it works when uh, a work of art is deliberately simple. Because the, that kind of matching idea uh, is one thing. And there, there are two ways it could be simple. It could be that we just provide an object which is itself quite simple as a perceptual object, or it could be the, the art that disguises art, where you know, a great deal of effort has gone into disguise how much work was taken to produce uh, that piece of work. And then you just look and you don't require so much skill for discrimination. So how does, how does simplicity and complexity deal with this sort of matching of motor skill and perceptual discrimination? I guess the idea is that um, to appreciate um, a work of art that's extremely simple. And by simple, I don't, I, I don't want to. Simple. Visual, well, I, yeah, so, but I want to stick to traditional art. I don't want to do Rothko or Barnett Newman or something, something like that. Um, you, could, you, could you could do a Chardin, say, compared with the Dutch 17th century, century still life. Yeah, 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 that's right. Exactly. Yeah. So if you take the, the chapel at the Bardia Fiesta, which I showed you earlier. Um, why is it good to, I mean, how does it require greater skill to appreciate that than it would if you appreciated that same thing but with a whole bunch of painting and so on and so forth attached to it? And I take it that I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know enough about classical architecture to tell you, but 
I take it that the actual proportions are very exactly rendered and that looking at two chapels which are done in this white um, very austere style um, an expert would be able to say oh this is absolutely beautiful because blah 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 and that expert has come up to the level of skill to do that uh, which enables her or him to make these discriminations uh, whereas um, um, yeah and, 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 and correspondingly the artist right artists come in a bunch of um, um, skill levels right <coughs> so some will do them less inspiringly than another so it might be that well if I've got you right the, the plan might be that skill is still needed because the, um, the viewer or the person appreciating can think of how this contrasts with other nearly but not so successful renderings, even if they're not at that time exercising skill in judging. Because, I mean, for example, the line of beauty is very simple, mm -hmm. but there was an artist, I can't remember who it was, uh, quite recent contemporary artist, who has got all the drawings of the line and then sort of, instead of rubbing them out, just makes heavier when it's perfect so that you can see how many near attempts and near failures there are before you get it. So it's as if your skilled looker, compared to a novice, doesn't just see the line, but sees it in contrast to what it might have been or failed yeah. to be. Yeah. That's right. And, and form sets the rules within which to make such yeah. discrimination. Who is my number two? I was thinking about the primary attractors you were talking about, and in relation to fashion, which I thought was quite interesting, because obviously you line them up one way, and then a couple of years later you get bored with it, so you actually line them up a different way. And that could easily explain the level of fashion, why it continually cycles around. It's just a, another kind of add-on to potentially the way that you were posing that right. particular thing, I think. Yeah, that, that's right. Except, you know, there's something funny about fashion, and. Um, um, Namely, that it's it's largely a Western phenomenon, uh, which is to say that clothing in um, in Asian cultures, for instance, tends to be, it can get to be very very fine in terms of the cloth, in terms of the tailoring, and so on and so forth. But there isn't fashion in the sense that uh, it's understood here, uh, because there's no completely new form of dress or you know, a change from frock coats to lounge suits or, you know, that sort of, that sort of thing. I mean, the, the form of dress is much more static. So, it, I mean, fashion is an art form, which a uh, particularly Western art form, um, as it turns out. Yeah. Could be. The other one was about, as, as an artist, why we actually paint, why we engage with these things. Because we started to study perceptual structure, how we actually see the world. So actually, for us, it's largely about self-realization. Well, that's a very, very important part of it. Our relationship with the real, we're now manifesting something about that. So that's a communication of who you are, and somebody else looking at that starts to understand that, certainly other painters. So we don't look at other painters in terms of um, necessarily what it is they've stuck down there. It's how far down that process of realization or how deep have they gone into their understanding of perceptual structure. So it's a kind of, you find yourself in relation to the other painters and how deep as they've got. Can you add anything to that level of insight? Um, at least I do. Yeah. Can, can, can I, I uh, I've got a suggestion to make. I will, I will get, get questions, questions, but we've got, got groups of people here from philosophy, from uh, various brain sciences, sciences from uh, practicing, practicing artists, uh, people, people like myself who are visual historians. historians. And, and that perhaps this goes, goes on to half past this session. session. Yes. Let's at quarter past think about how each of our groups view the other groups. And with, with the indulgence of chair, chair, I would kick off looking at the attractors, so we, we could come back at that. But, but let's set quarter of an hour aside uh, for a kind of knockabout between, uh, between the different factors here and how, how we actually think about each other and what we regard. What, what we, we think, think is the philosophers doing, doing, what we think is the brain scientists doing, and what they think what we're doing. So let's have a really nasty quarter of an hour. Um, <laughs> anyway, who, who's the uh, number three question? You're, you're number four. four you're after, after this, 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 this lot in this um, lane, I've got, got it first, and then to you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay.
Yeah, you're, you're, you're next, next right. right. So, so I, I yeah. wondered about, so you contrast it to explanations at one stage, Stephen Davies and the Tubi and Cosmedes, and you, you liked Tubi and Cosmedes, you didn't like the Davies. But I wondered whether, if I've understood the two and the difference between them, they're not just proximal and distal explanations which you probably want to put together in the end. So um, Davies is saying that we like these things because we like being in these environments and two and Cosmetas are saying we like looking at them. But why do we like looking at them? Well, we presume they because we like being in them. And like, because we like being in them, then when we see pictures of them, we imagine being in the environment, and that's nice. But the explanation for all that stuff has in the end to be that we enjoy being in the environment. So I, I guess I don't see that there's, we need to see this as two explanations. And how does Davies, and how, so you're telling me how Cosmides could apply to a Davies type of thing and maybe that's right I'm not I'm, I'm sort of so suppose I I see uh, a ski hill and I've enjoyed skiing in that ski hill completely fictitious by the way because I don't ski at all um, and I, I look at the ski hill and say oh that's great and what, what great times I had there and so on and so forth that or I look at my house and say oh I've had so many wonderful memories of this house and how great is that and I really enjoy looking at it because it's not clear to me that that's aesthetic pleasure. I mean it may be to some extent but I mean I don't think it's it's your typical paradigm aesthetic appreciation. That's one point that I would make. So yeah so to, uh, to be and Cosmides uh, have, a, have a, a thesis that they're talking about literature by the way and there was an article of some journal on fiction, and they, this quote that I took is just about fiction. Uh, but but they have they have a sort of a similar uh, attitude to the one that I have, namely that contemplating fiction helps you develop a heightened sense of reality, understanding of reality. So you learn by contemplating fiction, and that's a very intellectual uh, thing. And I'm doing perception, but. Um, it's, it's, it's of the same form. But let's concede for a moment your point that Cosmides and Tubi's thing about um, engaging in sensory attention, um, that that can somehow be reduced to Stephen Davies's thing, which I doubt. Explained in terms of it. Yeah, explained in terms of it, which I, which I think, which I, which I would take issue with, but let's just suppose that's right. Um, how does uh, Stephen Davies get the pleasure of contemplation? I mean, he's out of it, right? He's out of the game, it seems to me, as far as pleasure of contemplation is concerned. Well, if, you, if the advantage is that you, you do well if you're in those environments, then you want to be the sort of creature who thinks about those environments. And when you're in an environment that isn't like that, you imagine being in that kind of an environment, and that gets you into that environment. Yeah, I agree. So you should, see, you should certainly have learned that those sorts of environments are good for you, and therefore you should have learned that you want to go back to them. But why should you look at them? What's the advantage of that? Well, you know, uh, uh, I, I have, have to say, say this doesn't... Yeah, yeah, there's also... Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the, the terror, terror of the sublime. sublime the sub and the sublime is completely... Terror of the sublime. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the uh, sublime is left out of it in any case. Should we pass, pass on to the next question? question who is... Yeah. yeah. So, um, so... So you so um, you you have this picture of ex executing something fluently and on the other hand making fine perceptual discriminations. And, you know, right. and the artist obviously has to have both of those working yes. presumably in a very close sort of tandem. Right. So the artist is is also unable to be the audience. And the audience have to have the perceptual skills in order to see. But I was just wondering the, the execution is one thing, so the, the, the fluency, you just can't, you, you couldn't add more knowledge, as it were, or ability to reason and get the execution. You might know exactly how the basketball player does it, but you can't, you can't do it. But what about the perceptual judgment? I mean, my, my feeling is that the perception changes 
that that is a perceptual experience, but other people would argue that your ability to make fine discriminations changes, uh, uh, some sort of judgment changes, which is separate from the experience itself. Right, so I don't want to take a, a, a stand on that, okay. right? Um, I, so the question, you can ask the question, does um, perceptual learning bring about a change in the nature of the perception, or does it simply bring about an increased ability to discriminate quickly, right? And um, I know some people argue one way, some people argue the other way, so uh, I know that um, Rob Goldstone, for example, uh, says that all perceptual learning um, um, involves cognitive penetration, which is to say change of perceptual phenomenology. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm sort of skeptical, but I, you know, I, I don't want to take a stand on that particular point. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on what I found um, you know, puzzling ontologies, categories. So, when you talk about the, the attractors on the one hand, whilst at the same time saying that it's wrong to assume that you know, the aesthetics reside in the object, and, and, and yet describing you know, the, 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 the aesthetic uh, motivators as features of the object, i.e. attractors, that seems to me, uh, at a minimum, Paradoxical. The other thing was. Sorry, just back up a second. Um, so, so, so I do think that the the features. I mean, so I don't think the ontology of perception is hugely important for this particular thing. But I am a realist in perception, and I think that the features do reside in objects. So, for instance, an object really is in C major harmony, or is does have inscribed upon it a beautiful row of little decorations, um, whatever, but the attraction of it is that you're fascinated at looking at it. Right, right but so the feature, the attractors, you know, the attractive feature seems yeah. to inhere in the object, yes. whereas I guess most people would say that the process of attraction resides as much in the person that is being but I attracted agree with that. I don't think that as, you know. I think that that's, that's right. So you, you made the distinction extremely well in what you said. The attractors reside in the object, and the process of attraction um, resides at least partially in, or in the interaction between the perceiver right. and the thing. So I think that you, you put it exactly correctly, right. and I don't think that's how it's that, yeah. yeah, that, that yeah. sounds a bit confusing, but so no, be you, it. You were uh, so clear about it. Right? Yes, no, exactly. So the process you yeah. know, sits yeah, yeah. in the middle, so we don't have to ascribe any right. features to either the, 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 um, the one who is attracted or the, the thing that is doing that the attracting. I guess that I don't get because it, it, it's a process of, of interaction. It's a process of uh, uh, it's a process which involves. So we don't have exactly. It, yeah. It's a process that involves two entities. Yeah. We don't have to preferentially treat the object over and above, you know, the no. the person who's doing, you know, who's yeah. being attracted. So that's, that's, that's a, you know a, a point for the later discussion on <laughs> how philosophers see this rather than scientists, etc. Mm -hmm. But then um, your distinction of the two categories, again, you know, sounds, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit puzzling. puzzling to me why there would be um, something that could be called primary and, and secondary, why there would only have to be two, and why they would happen to be the ones that you mentioned, because I think we can get very far with just form and content. You know, so if we take the picture of the old lady, um, you know, the form is, you know, what we know to be the form. The content would then be the trigger to look, you know, in terms of analogy of whether the picture she has of herself is analogically consistent with what she sees on that painting. And guess what? She doesn't like it because she sees herself differently. The other people, the third, third person people who look at this, who are not concerned in, you know, who are not that lady, would look at it differently because they don't have any preconceived notion of what they expect to see, so they judge it on its own merits. So with, with, with form and, and content, you know, and form looking at all the varieties of, of structure and pattern and, 
you know, the, the, the six adjectives you had to describe all of the same things, which is, you know, just structure, really. It was what um, Margaret Livingston was, was talking about this morning, which is the purely formal elements, you know, before you get to the aesthetic appreciation of it, so the, represent, the way it's represented. I, I didn't see why those two categories, and only those two categories, would be um, would, would trump you know the more intuitive categories of form and content. Uh, with the leave of the two people who've already logged up the questions, that actually leads into what I was thinking about in my let's get nasty session. So um, if, if I may let us think about that. And this does relate to the primary attractors. Now I would say as a historian of visual things, I don't recognize these sets at all. I don't recognize primary hmm. attractors, I don't recognize secondary attractors. What I recognize in how a work of art is experienced, that, that is to say a real work of art in real space, in real time, with real people, is an absolute interlockedness of form and content. And by content I mean not just what's in the picture, but also the context. That is to say, if Rembrandt paints a self-portrait, uh, he is painting something which you're meant to think of as a portrait and ideally you recognize it as a Rembrandt self-portrait. We go into a gallery, it's a very complex business of what we think we're doing with this and as, uh, as we've shown that if you think it's a Rembrandt self-portrait or not a Rembrandt self-portrait but close, you do very different things to it. So. As, As a historian, historian I, would I would say, and this relates to a certain amount of neuroscience, particularly some of the uh, figures who are actually absent from this particular proceedings, um, who are dealing essentially with an entirely formalist view of what art is about. A Rembrandt self-portrait isn't like that, nor is an abstract picture. An abstract picture says, I am an abstract picture, and it expects you to know what to do with it. You see it in particular circumstances. You've got particular questions you bring to that as a painting saying, I'm a painting, I'm a painting, I'm a painting. And of course, if you look at individual ones, like the, the Mondrian Broadway Boogie Woogie, if you look at Pollock, look at Rothko, they're full of content, both in terms of what we bring to them in context. So I'd say before we even get going on the formal categories, we've got a super category of the in interlockingness of form and content, and in content I'm saying just both the content which is in the picture, but also the context of viewing. And I'm not saying that you can't, as a philosopher or a neuroscientist, tease out basic mechanisms, but I think we have to be more modest in what we're doing in this. We're getting out a component of it, and you're not really telling us about what art is about. No, I, and nor was I trying to tell you what art was about, um, because uh, for one thing, I, I'm dealing only with the perceptual um, um, attraction of art, and obviously anybody who deals with art or what it's about has to deal with a great deal more than that. Um, but, but you have these categories, categories which... which um, yeah. It, you yeah, know, the primary attractors, pattern, melody, emotional appeal, where is content, even emotional appeal, is taken essentially in that Rothko manner as being an abstract thing. It's, it's colour, it's form. It's yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean you're, you're pushing the idea that these things can't be in any, in any, in any circumstances separated out or dealt with in abstraction. And maybe it's a mistake to do that. But that's what I'm trying to do. I'm not, I'm not pushing it as an exercise. I'm, I'm trying to get it located in, a, in the totality of the endeavor, which I take it collectively. Right, and I'm not dealing with the totality of the endeavor. And, you know, I sort of explicitly said so. Um, uh, okay, let's go there. I'm curious to hear what you have to say about primitive art, caveman art, and maybe. Yeah, the primary and secondary attractors in primitive art, and, uh, and perhaps in African art. Maybe you have nothing to say. Uh, not specifically, because I'm not, I don't know much about these things um, uh, in detail. I mean, it's, it's clear that in African art, or in Lascaux, or in, for that matter, you know, the stone flakes made by um, Homo ergaster, um, there are certain features 
which are superficially attractive, such as symmetry or pattern or such, so on and so forth, um, or a certain kind of representation of a figure. Um, but there's also, um, over and above that, form and skillful execution, which um, um, is super erogatory with respect to, that is to say you could represent a figure or you could give an idea of a certain pattern without having all of this extra stuff put in. So and it seems to me that that's no less true of primitive art, as you call it, um, than it is of uh, whatever the opposite of it, of primitive art is. Yeah, sure. So, so, sorry, sorry, actually, uh, it's all right. Uh, let, let this first. <laughs> thank you. Uh, um, you. You argue that uh, art perception is instrumental to some extent in the development of uh, baseline uh, perception skills. No, not, not art perception, but just perception. Aesthetic of perception. Um, to what extent are you prepared to uh, extend the claim about evol evolutionary bias where of uh, aesthetic perception? So what I have in mind is, for instance, uh, early in the, the third critique, Kant contemplated that every scientific judgment would in fact come with uh, aesthetic pleasure attached to it, because the pleasure was the effect of getting the intuition and concept right. And then when he talks about uh, indefinite concepts, that's what he has in mind. So there's a clear uh, evolutionary underpinning uh, to uh, aesthetic pleasure on this view. To what extent uh, are you prepared to uh, go further and uh, spell out the evolutionary Im implications of your view? So, um, as long, I, I'm, I'm quite happy to have an evolutionary story because there are certain natural points where that can enter, right? Um, I think that um, evolutionary value has to be attached, however, not to the object that the art represents, if there is any object that the art represents, uh, but rather to the appreciators actually contemplating that object. And by contemplating, I don't mean anything grand. I just mean looking at or listening to. So um, it could very well be that human skills are relatively, these, these, these human skills are relatively recently developed in evolutionary history. And for that reason, um, it takes a process of development beyond mere genetic expression to actually um, realize these skills. So the whole, uh, so it, it, it could very well be that clay of various sorts, right, has an evolutionary value, the evolutionary value being that um, it develops skills which were present, as it were, only potentially in the genome. So there's a, a process of development which has to be added on to the process of genetic expression. Um, one more point, that humans have um, a capacity or, um, to develop these skills beyond a certain spontaneously developed level. So we have skills which can go beyond what they were evolutionarily uh, selected for, um, right? And we have an urge to develop these skills beyond that. That's a universal urge. What the evolutionary value of that urge is, I don't know. Uh, I, I have a lot, lot, lot of sympathy with that, that but as trained as a biologist, I have a lot of sympathy with that evolutionary view. And there is a sense in which, and I'm looking at this in a book which will come out in due course, um, that the intuitions of artists and scientists at looking at natural phenomena, they can often look at the same natural phenomena and say, ah, there's something fantastic happening there. And we are equipped by evolution to extract these systems of order from this chaos or make some sense of it. And it's interesting that the, the scientist will go and try and explain it in some way with a certain body of explanation. The artist will present it to us in a rather different way, an open way. But uh, no, I'm entirely happy to think that there are basic uh, evolutionary perspective proclivities which art has learned to play upon.
and to hard, doing, doing paradoxical ways, which may be non-functional when we do them in art other than in a societal and in, in various other ways, but not biologically functional. And, uh, I think that, uh, that makes entire sense. Since we disagree about primary things, we can agree. <laughs> we got an area of agreement. Um, the first one is, you were, the, you were going or not? Yeah. yeah. Well, <clears throat> I'll be very brief. I, have, uh, I was much taken by your example of, of the painter Wyatt and the portrait he painted. And there are, yeah, sorry. You, you mentioned Wyatt, yeah. Jamie Wyatt's portrait of this medical lady. Um, there are two other rather interesting examples, which I'll mention very, very briefly. I won't tell the story, but I'll wrap a question around them. Um, one um, <coughs> concerns, um, well, I mean, my point is that surely there are other attractors. There are lots of attractors. They may not all be perceptual or closely perceptual. I mean, one would be um, um, the... Um, Fame. I mean, an artist who's famous immediately, uh, people are attracted to his work, even if it's just a scribble, um, and um, or just a signature, perhaps even. And the, many years ago, of course, that Graham Southern's portrait of Churchill was destroyed, um, allegedly. I mean, or it said that Valentine uh, didn't like it and she wanted it destroyed. Um, <coughs> And then um, we must remember, too, that um, art is a, is a form of communication and that this must surely be an important aspect, an attractor, if you like. Um, there's a very interesting um, article by Bruce Chatwin in his book, What Am I Doing Here? Uh, he tells us how, when he was working at Sotheby's, he met the Bay, who was staying in the Ritz Hotel and needed money and used to sell the young Chatwin objects and so on. And that bay said, Mr. Chatwin, you have got the eye. Now, um, how, how do we sort of develop that? And um, I, I wonder, um, you know, some paintings, whether you've got the eye or not, are immediate attractors pretty well to most people, particularly religious paintings, for example. They may be quite dreadful, nevertheless. You know, some people are attractive, etc. I mean, do, do, these are not entirely perceptual, but what's going on here, and how do we learn about it? No, they're not entirely perceptual. I think some of them are not even aesthetic. I mean, uh, they, yeah. the, um, but, but you're right. I mean, there's certain uh, things which are attractive to everybody. Um, a lot of people say that um, in music and in painting, West uh, European tradition has dwelt on those, whereas in, you know, in China or Japan, um, they haven't. You know, they haven't tried to get something that's universally attractive, or um, that wasn't a uh, wasn't an aim. That that the secondary attractors were more important. Um, um, so yeah. So I think universal attraction is certainly an aspect of certain works of art that everybody can appreciate them. Um, it, um, it isn't necessarily a virtue, but it can, I mean, it can be present in something which is a great work of art. Yeah, the the art, art, I think, what I thought, thought was very interesting, you said, which is, is art or is it art? I would, I would say it, it depends which period you drop it into. If, if you dropped in the saccharine line into, into the French 18th, 18th century, they'd, they'd have been happy with that, that but we regarded the art as an abomination. We've, we've seen Diane Arbus, we've, we've seen Freud, Freud portraits, and we're, we're ready for uh, that less flattering, gritty, uh, in your face kind, kind literally in your face kind. Yeah. kind no, that, that's very, clearly a very skilled yeah. Yeah. Uh, production, there's no question about that. So, so, so the 18th century would have said that's not a work of art, that's just an ugly thing. thing. Whereas right. we, we, look, we look at the saccharine one and say it's not really a work of art. Scottish portrait painting in Scotland, 18th century, with the ruddy faces and everything else. That was a well, in there. Yeah, yeah, I would say the Rayburn and so on are not as extreme as that, that was. But um, anyway, we can talk about that. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, no, sorry, sorry we, I do have some sort of order, order which I'm trying to keep control, control of. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I'm just really following up the last question, but this is a very individualistic account of how we look at things. And I would have thought we always take account of other people when they're looking at 
particularly at works of art, even perhaps the artist, but certainly what other people will think, and um, which is actually evolutionary, very useful, because it's very useful to know what, to predict what other people will find attractive. But this allows us to have what people nowadays call guilty pleasures, where we say, I really like this, although I know it's kitsch. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. No, I think that I think that that's right. I think this um, person called Jenny McMahon, who teaches at Adelaide, and she's um, got a notion that what form does in art is to make in groups and out groups, right? Um, so that there's some kind of sharing of a certain kind of experience, right, um, among the in group that corresponds to a particular form and. And similarly, the, the same for other, other forms. And that's I think that's compatible with the picture that I'm presenting, because what I want to say is that um, there's a skill set of, appreciate, of, of, of appreciating art, which is not universal across all forms of art, because uh, what you have to do is to pick up on the execution of particular things in a art form, in an, out, in an art form. And um, when you do that, you can have a discussion with other people who appreciate the same art form, whereas uh, you can't have this kind of universal, very few of us can have universal expertise across all art forms. Right? So, so I, think, I think there's room for that kind of um, structure or social structure in my account. I have a question that I guess from a, a neuroscience perspective, sometimes I struggle with the distinction between emotional pleasure and aesthetic pleasure. And I noticed throughout your talk, emotions didn't seem to come into it anywhere, although I think there were a few doors they, they could have come through. Do you have any, is there, is there any reason why you didn't incorporate emotions more into so, this framework? I think emotion is quite heterogeneous with respect to that two by two table that I showed you, um, where it was either object directed or activity directed and either prospective or reactive. So I think that you can think of emotions in all of those. So then emotion becomes the universal that Well, I don't know. I mean, the universal is motivational state or evaluative state or something of that sort. I don't know what the exact characteristic of what an emotion is and how an emotion is distinguished from, um, let's say, pleasure or something like that. And I don't, I don't want to get into that here. I mean, I, I take it that an emotion is, is usually action directed. Action, not necessarily activity, but action directed. And, uh, but there are, I, I think that if you take that table, you could, you could fill in emotions, different emotions, into all four boxes. I, I don't know the aesthetic pleasure box, but certain, uh, joy. Joy would be, I think, in the, aesthetic, the same as the aesthetic pleasure box. Um, well, but, yeah. Sorry, well, one, one, more, one more question in the front, and then I think we go, go for our tea, tea, and you can then pick, pick up with moment after, or, or during, during tea. tea. Yeah. Yep. Um, so Martin asked you about um, the distinction between form and content and how that fitted into the um, uh, primary and secondary attractor distinction. And so you, one of the things you said was that like, you wanted form to be one of the secondary attractors. And I don't see why you couldn't put um, content into the secondary attractors too, so being a portrait, being a self-portrait and so on. So then you would just get that form and content were just different forms of secondary attractors. But the thing... I don't understand fully about your view was coming back to the very first question that was asked, that Barry asked. So could you tell me a little bit about what the distinction is between forum and pattern? Because you thought of pattern as being a primary attractor and forum as a secondary attractor. But I'm not, I'm not sure I really I, I was just using, I was using form, first of all, in a way that probably is a very loose kind of way and probably art historians and critics would not would, would want me to be a lot more precise about that but what I was uh, what I had in mind by form is some kind of codified set of rules which governed uh, not governed but governed the appreciation 
of an artwork. So the kinds of things that I have in mind is whether color is allowed or not. That's, that's, a, that's a, uh, a feature of form. Uh, whereas pattern is just like repetition, occlusion, straight line, line of beauty, and so on and so forth. So uh, yeah, it, th that might be confusing that those two words were used for quite different things. Well, then in that case, why shouldn't one think of maybe content as being secondary factors and what Martin might call forum as being in the primary? Or in the primary? primary oh. So that those distinctions might end up lining up. I see. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I just didn't want to get into form versus content because it's such a, it's such a, I mean, we mean something quite different by form and content than uh, art historians and art critics mean by it. But um, hmm. I didn't think that anything that Martin was talking about was, would fall into primary attractors, but that was, that was just the impression I got. I'm not sure. Uh, well, well, yeah, yeah, we, we have to draw to a close. close. Perhaps uh, the form, form and content, content I could tell a, a story to finish with. Um, when, when I was an undergraduate at uh, Cambridge, Cambridge doing natural, natural sciences, Gombrich, Gombrich came to speak. He was a professor, professor and he came to speak in Downing. And um, uh, he talked about various things, things uh, quite a lot of iconographical things. And I'd been reading at that point Clive Bell and Roger Fry. Uh, I knew nothing, nothing about anything in art, but uh, not, not much has changed, but anyway. Um, uh, and at the end, being a kind of keen bullshitter then as now, I put my hand up and I said, Professor Gombrich, uh, does the fact that all these paintings have subjects get in the way of our perception of significant form? And uh, he said, ah, uh, uh, he said, I think if I renaissance, painter and a patron are doing a Renaissance Madonna, they wanted it to be a Madonna. And uh, I was completely destroyed in one go. Anyway, that's form and content. Okay, thank you.